Yep, one shot, it's all you get. Hickok 45. Muzzle loader from the Civil War era, infield. One shot, then you gotta go back through the reloading process, don't you? Well, that's what most people were carrying and using in the 1850s and even in the 1860s through the Civil War. So you saw what it requires to load that. I didn't have a paper cartridge as they had, but you've got to get the powder in, ram the ball down, cap the nipple, and often you have to use a ball starter. But uh, that gets it loaded, then you have one shot, don't you? Let's put all this stuff down here because we're not going to need it anymore. <laughs> and let's set the rifle over here. That's a beautiful rifle. Powerful, powerful. You know, shoots a 58 caliber mini ball and uh, definitely uh, lethal and very effective. And used extensively in the Civil War on both sides, whether it was the Springfield or the, uh, the infield or a variety of others, right? But you're one shot, one shot. Now, you happen to see some interesting firearms on the table, don't you? A lot of Winchesters and uh, reproductions of Winchesters, and uh, that's kind of what we're about, about the difference here. So let's take a look here. We have a Henry that uh, recently uh, came by. Mine, we have an 1866 Winchester from uh, made by Uberti and uh, uh, lent to us by Taylor and uh, Taylors and Company. Beautiful firearm, appreciate that, T&E gun. We have my 1873 uh, Winchester made by Uberti, you've seen before. We have an 1876 uh, made by Chaparral Arms, a reproduction of the 1876 that was uh, lent to us by Tennessee Gun Country up in Clarksville. We sure appreciate that. Don't see many of those. And then my 1886 uh, Browning, which is a reproduction of the, the uh, 1886 Winchester, of course. Okay. Then we've got an 1892 mine that is an actual Winchester 1892. Uh, made in 1916, this one. Then we have a Winchester, mine, uh, 1894, classic. That one is mine, and it uh, it was uh, made in the 1950s, pre-64 Winchester. And then we have a an 1895 Winchester. I don't see a lot of those. This one was made in 1925. And it's 30 out 6 was lent to us by uh, Guns and Leather over in Greenbrier. So we appreciate that. We get a lot of support from uh, local gun shops and you all and everybody. And we certainly appreciate it. This way we're able to bring you this sort of uh, thing and uh, show you some different firearms. So, what are we doing here today? I don't know. Is this heaven or what? I mean, look at this table. I could just... <laughs> I could, a pretty good video, I think, for me to watch at least, would be to just let John just move the camera back and forth for about 20 minutes and look at these beautiful firearms. Well, we'll do a little bit more than that. We want to give you an idea as to oh, what the evolution uh, was of the, the lever action as uh, per Winchester. Now, Marlin made some great uh, you know, lever guns, but they were a little bit later. Okay, They came into the game a little bit later. The the early innovations were, you know, basically Winchester. And, you know, the first one on the table, as you see, is the Henry, Henry rifle. Now, you might be asking if you don't know and have not really, you know, read much about it or just, just kind of new to it, why do you have a Henry? That's not a Winchester, that's a Henry rifle. I know it when I see it. Well, uh, this really is a Winchester when you get right down to it, okay? the. You may be familiar, let me show you, I have a picture. I don't have one of these, so all I have is a, a lame uh, picture of the volcanic uh, pistol. <laughs> and look at that receiver. Doesn't that look a lot like uh, the Henry? You know, it's just, just basically kind of where it started. And uh, the volcanic, and they actually, I think, made some carbines too, the Volcanic Arms Company. And that goes back into, gosh, I think, uh, well, I guess it's the 1850s, the early 1850s, I think. And uh, that's where all this started. And uh, even Horace Smith and Daniel Wesson were involved in that and coming up with the action for this. They are very instrumental in that, in, in fact. So you don't think of Smith and Wesson when you think of Winchester, but they were very involved in, in that action. You know, I mean, some earlier people, Hunt and uh, 
uh, who was the other one? I can't think of them. But there were some earlier attempts, and they bought the rights to that, and they they created the the volcanic. It used that weird bullet. If you've seen the 1866 video, it's like, it's like a mini ball, and the powders in the back of it, and you know, a little, you know, a, a fulminant of mar mercury to, to get it to fire. And but it was very underpowered, and that was the main reason that gun pretty much failed. You know, they they ran into. Uh, uh, I think debt, severe debt with it, even though it was a well-made firearm from what I understand, but they just couldn't settle enough of them, weak, underpowered, but it was the basics of, of this firearm. So again, you have Winchester involved because he was a major stockholder in that company. And Smith and Wesson, uh, they worked on cartridge development and that firearm, and then they went on to do revolvers. You know, we know they did a good job with that. And Benjamin, or not Benjamin, but uh, Oliver Winchester became, I think, president of the company, the major stockholder. And he went about trying to improve that gun and do something more with it. He hired uh, Benjamin Tyler Henry to, to oversee the plant. He was uh, the superintendent. And he was currently, I think at that time, working in his uh, shirt company because Winchester was famous for making, he made his early money from the shirt business, making shirts, believe it or not. And Henry had had experience in working in gun shops since he was really young. He even worked for Springfield Armory, I read, uh, for a while. But he, at that point, he was working for, uh, he was uh, in the shirt factory, a master mechanic on the sewing machines. Okay, this was a big operation. Well, he hired him. And it was that was in with 57, I think. He changed the name of the Volcanic Arms Company to the New Haven Arms Company or Repeating Arms Company. I, I get confused sometimes. I'm easily confused. But it was New Haven Arms Company, I think. And that's where Henry did his work. He got the, this thing uh, created. He worked day and night. The Civil War, you know, war was uh, was looming on the horizon, and he put many, many, many hours into taking that volcanic and creating a, a better action. Uh, the cartridge, uh, you know, which I've shown you all before, the 44, and that is, yeah, that's it. The 44 uh, Henry Rimfire. So once they had the cartridge and the action and the tubular magazine and all that, uh, you know, a real rifle, they went to town, this, this was it. Uh, in 1860, they did the patents on this thing. Think about that, 1860. That's, that's, that's amazing because, again, most people were carrying around and using a single shot, whether it was a Sharps or it was uh, you know, a, in the field or a Springfield, whatever it was, that they were using it uh, in the Civil War, going to be using. And now notice how this one loads. I'll put some rounds in it. This was 45 caliber because nobody makes 44 rimfire anymore. You have to uh, turn that like that and you slide the rounds in. You want to do it, uh, you don't want it to have too much angle because, see, they're sliding down there and they're going to hit each other so you don't want to just put this on your toe and let the rounds slam into each other it might not be good okay you could have not a good outcome how's that so this will hold uh, i think of the uh, 44 rim fire would hold about 15 something like that so pretty cool pretty cool now depends on what you compare it with of course compared with a, a single shot how cool would this be you know having a firearm like this where you could just put the ammo in there several rounds like that. You also don't want to let this slam against it either. Say you were just going to load three or four and you got more distance for this to fall, this spring-loaded tab, you don't want it slamming into the rounds either, just for safety's sake. All right? So, the firearm is loaded. Let's take ourselves back into 1860. It was actually about 1862 before they actually uh, came up on the market much, but uh, it, it was, uh, the patents were there and uh, the drawing team, he was ready to produce it in, in uh, I think, late 1860 and 1861. There was a little bit of delay. But that is it. This was the first lever gun that was really suitable for practical use. And the first time in history where you could actually, you know, fire rapidly with a rifle, you know, in a practical firearm. Let's try it. Let's take a couple of shots with it. Bring one up and shoot something like a two liter. I think that's why uh, Benjamin Tyler Henry invented this thing. <laughs> 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 
Now, how would that compare with what I did as uh, we opened here, loading one shot, pouring the powder in? You can see, now you notice the tab has moved down here. So, you know, it was, it was beginning to hit my hand. So I need to move up there. If I'm gonna take another shot, which I will, let's go to the gong. <laughs> let's try the red plate. Oh. Come on now. I'm going to hit it. Oh well. We'll try it again later. I, uh, I, I hit it the other day. Uh, the sights seem to be really right on. So that's a lot of firepower uh, in a firearm. Doesn't impress us today necessarily, right? With all the cool firearms we have uh, with large capacity. But in its day, that was amazing. And it worked. So pretty, pretty uh, uh, astounding really for 1860. Again, if you compare it with the single shots, that is, is quite amazing, all right? Now it wasn't perfect, uh, but it was, it was not bad for, a, for I should, shouldn't say first pass because, you know, it evolved into this uh, and you had a lot of people involved there, Smith and Wesson, and, you know, uh, Henry uh, Winchester. Winchester was more the business guy uh, than anything. He wasn't a gun guy, but he put it all together and uh, it resulted in this. And uh, this this was the firearm that uh, you know, the, uh, was used in the Civil War to some extent in limited numbers because it, it came out in 62 when it was available. It was $45, $50. The military was still resistant to this kind of firearm. They thought oh, it's too much ammo, they'll waste the ammo. Uh, it, it's fragile, you bend up the magazine, it won't work, you, know, you drop it, uh, is ammo going to be available? So they were really resistant to it. So most of the firearms that were used in the military were on the uh, federal side, the Union side, uh, and they were purchased, you know, private purchases. Soldiers would just buy it and the ammo because they saw the advantage of it and they wanted one. So there were, there were some exceptions. I think the military bought about 1,700 of them and used about 1,000, but uh, most of them were private purchases and it was quite effective where it was used properly we won't get into all that with today i wanted to mainly just show you how it operates and uh, it was the firearm that uh that it, i think that's where according to you know what you read that uh colonel mose mosby i think was the one who uh came up with a line that you know that it's that damn yankee rifle that they load on sunday and it fires all week you know he was a confederate uh, officer and so you probably heard that line before, but it was it was that type of firearm because think about it If you're used to just single shots and all of a sudden somebody's pumping out 15 and maybe four or five troops are pumping out 15 rounds at you so Pretty pretty effective, but it just wasn't in widespread use in the Civil War But just again be aware it was it was there 62 63 64 65 and it was used in, in several battles by different units but just not in big numbers. But so the, the technology of the lever gun was around. Now, let's move on to the next uh, step because this is again, 1860, 1860, you know, two when it's available. And a little bit later, Winchester uh, decided we needed to improve that. And by then, I think in 1866, he changed the name of the company again from uh, New Haven Arms to, uh, to, to Winchester Repeating Arms. So that's why the 1866 has the name Winchester on it and, and this one doesn't, okay? But they're the same system. They're basically the same uh, toggle link system. And again, I wasn't gonna take a plate off in this. That's why I took a picture. And uh, this is what the insides look like. Whenever you hear the toggle link system, that's what you're dealing with, and you pull that lever down, it's you know, kind of arms. And they do okay, but they're not as strong as the later lever guns, where you've got a falling block that, that blocks the bolt, and that bolt just will not move. You know, you hit it with a sledgehammer. Uh, these were not that strong, and that's why they're chambered in you know, relatively light cartridges, you know, pistol cartridges, basically, right? Any of the guns that have this system except for the 1876 uh, which we'll, we'll look at in a little bit okay so, but that's what it looks like on the inside right? the toggle uh, system and that's what this one has too now 
1866, you know, by then, these had been used, the Henry had been used in, uh, in the field enough, uh, and, in, in, you know, in the Civil War, they learned a lot. They learned, of course, that dirt gets in the magazine. Imagine that, you know, and uh, clogs it up. So they wanted to do something about that. Plus the loading system. You know, you've got to bring this up, bring it over, and, you know, drop your rounds in, as you saw me do. You got this sleeve on the barrel. I read that uh, soldiers or anybody who didn't keep these oiled, this would rust uh, right here, and this collar would, would freeze up on them. You know, that, that was one of the liabilities of the firearm. And, of course, again, you got this, this uh, open magazine. And this tab, you know, there it is. And it comes down into your hand, and so you got to be moving your hand around and that sort of thing. And then also, if you don't know this, if you shoot black powder, I have competed in a lot of black, a lot of matches, uh, cowboy matches with black powder. Barrel gets really hot. Uh, it, it's, it's, it just does. It doesn't have to be a hot load necessarily, but black powder really heats up the barrel when you shoot, especially in a lever gun, several shots that you know quickly. And so there you are, your hands on that barrel. See, so this would get hot, and of course. That's why they went to the, the, the forearm. So you got that covered here. Now you couldn't do that very well unless you came out with a different loading system, couldn't you? So a guy named King came up with this loading gate uh, patent, and that's what the, all lever guns, you know, since the uh, Henry have. So that is cool because you can just load it and top it off anytime you want to. Does the job. Also, they separated the, the tube, uh, magazine tube, from the barrel. You notice on this Henry, it's all one piece. Man, can you imagine manufacturing that? So that is all one piece, the tube and the barrel. Whereas with the uh, you know, subsequent models, you just have a separate uh, you know, piece there. So that way you can have a barrel that's octagonal if you want. It's a round barrel, uh, shorter. You can have a shorter magazine, just whatever you, you want there. So with the 66, you still have the brass frame. And same, pretty much the same toggle link system. Big differences, of course, to the loading system. You just load it right through there. You can shoot four or five. You can sneak a couple more rounds in, keep shooting, you know, just uh, like we're accustomed to doing. And, uh, and then, of course, the tubular magazine. All that is enclosed, so you're not getting dirt in it. Uh, you've got a grip. You can shoot all day. It gets hot. doesn't matter. Your hand's not on the barrel. So those were the big changes, you know, in, in 1866. Still fired the same cartridge. Both of these fired the... Uh, Rimfire 44. It's about a, I think a 216 grain, 220 grain bullet, and uh, 25 or so grains of black powder, which doesn't mean much to most people, but it was uh, it was an adequate little round, okay? And uh, nothing like some of the rounds that came later, but it was a pistol round and uh, did the job. This is a Schofield round. I was put that out to show you the difference in the cartridges. These are copper. See, the early cases were copper. They weren't brass. So both of these are really early. And they're both ramfire. All right, that went really early. Right? That's an actual real mini ball. Okay, might have bounced off somebody's head there or something. Okay, so we got the Henry, and by the way, there were a few of these made with uh, iron frames. So I think the first run of a couple hundred of them, something like that. And then, then they went to to brass, and then of course brass with all the uh, 1866s. Now the big year was 1873. 1873. We went to the iron frame, Winchester did. And uh, <laughs> beautiful gun. That is one of the most famous uh, lever guns, of course, out there. Movies made about it. Uh, you know, a lot of people refer to that as the gun that won the West. We use that phrase with all sorts of, uh, of firearms, don't we? And in fact, I was reading that in 1919, Winchester actually came up with that line as an advertising slogan or something. So that's where that comes from. But uh, this, this is an iron frame, same toggle link system, okay? But you got an iron frame. Big difference though is the cartridge it fires. This was, uh, this came out with the 4440. I don't have a 4440, but it was, you know, this is 45 Colt, which this is chambered in. But you know, it's a standard cartridge, uh, more powerful than the 44 rim fire and a center fire like this. So it was a center fire, the first center fire in the, the lever gun. So that was big. That was really big. Let's put a couple of those in. This is one of my favorites, as you probably know, if you've been around a little bit. We'll take just a couple of shots with it. There's a, there's a couple of movies out there called the Winchester, you know, 73. The first one was Jimmy Stewart, and there was a remake of that later. 
but uh, this is a oh, this was a popular gun carried and used by so many people. Let me put my ears on here, see if I can get it to shoot. I got a tang sight on this one. All right, nice. <laughs> I haven't shot it for a while. So let's see if we can hit. There we go. That's better. Nice. So this is still the toggle link system. Uh, these three firearms, if we took the side plates off, they would look about the same, okay? But this one uh, is where it evolved into a steel frame, iron frame, center fire cartridge, 4440, and it was chambered for some other uh, cartridges as well. But uh, the most significant event there was the cartridge and the iron frame, I guess, okay? And it was a big year, remember? You know, the 4570 came out that year, the cartridge, the trap door, uh, Springfield and uh, the Colt single action army in 45 Colt that year big big year this was part of it now as we move on up into 1876 <laughs> we have the Centennial model okay you notice this one looks a little bigger doesn't it well we had all these pistol caliber basic uh, you know rifles there was a need and a desire in a market for a larger caliber, something that would handle a more powerful round. And this was the first Winchester that actually was chambered for something that had some serious power to it, comparable to the 4570. So this was very popular, uh, even for buffalo hunting. There was still some buffalo hunting going on with this. Any game on North American continent, you know, this, this rifle was probably used uh, to hunt. I know Teddy Roosevelt used it, liked it. He liked Winchesters, you know, even the 73, but he hunted with this in Africa and uh, in uh, the United States as well. So this was big. Now this is, I like to refer to it as the uh, 73 on steroids. You see it's, it's, it seems like the same gun, but it's just bigger, much bigger. Same toggle link system, some improvements, but uh, this is bigger and then, you know, it would handle a larger cartridge. Uh, Again, it came out in the centennial year of uh, 1876. It was a celebration uh, there in Philadelphia where they introduced it uh, in, in 1876. I couldn't go. I was in the seventh grade and had homework to do. But I remember when they introduced that. It was, uh, it was a big deal. And people were anxious to get a large caliber lever gun. It would still hold like whatever, 12, 13 rounds. I forget the exact capacity on this one, depending on your caliber. These are uh, 4060 right here I have, but uh, it, was, it was a cat's meow there at that time. Okay, moving on up. 1886. Now Marlin came out with a 4570 lever gun in I think 1881, I believe it was. So there was pressure for Winchester to come up with something that would handle a longer case. The 76 would handle powerful you know cartridges but it wouldn't quite handle a, a 4570 round and 4590 and some of the bigger ones uh what fit this thing was chambered in i think 5110 so it would handle really long cases so that was that was the the thing there and this was the first lever gun that an old buddy of ours designed you know who i'm talking about mr john browning yes it was uh interesting uh, very quickly the you know, he, he came up with the, the high wall, what was later referred to as the high wall, single shot rifle. When he was in his 20s, it started showing up. They started making them, uh, John Browning and his brother, and one of the sales guys from Winchester got, <laughs> ran into one and said, whoa, who's this? Where, where'd this come from? He just said Browning Brothers on the barrel, you know? So he sent one back home to the Winchester uh, offices, and about a week later, uh, Bennett, who was pretty much in charge at that time, he, he came to Ogden looking up uh, the Browning brothers to see who made that single shot and he wanted to buy the rights to it and he did. He found uh, John Browning working in the shop and while he was there, John Browning said, oh by the way, I have a little wooden carving here of a, of a lever gun you might be interested in and it was this gun. It was this baby right here. And so the rest is history. Thus began a long relationship between John Browning and Winchester. So they took his carvings, they modified it a little bit, but this is uh, the, the big difference here, you see, with these uh, locking lugs, 
falling blocks instead of one block like on a sharps you know you got two of them more more in the side of the receiver and they come up and really lock that bolt in and plus it's big enough to handle uh, based on the way the action opens it'll handle a long cartridge so this was an extremely popular rifle it uh this was nice, the 76, but this was better. This would handle longer cartridges, very powerful cartridges, and uh, considered to be the most beautiful and strongest lever gun maybe ever made. Beautiful gun. It's a favorite of uh, any Winchester fan, that's for sure. So this is really cool, the 1886. And then, oh, a few years later, uh, Winchester was interested in you know, another, updating their pistol, you know, lever guns, basically. And they went to John Browning again, and they asked him what he could do. So he, he came up with this baby. Let's take a couple of shots with it. This is, this is now, this is a Model 92, but it's also chambered at 357 Magnum. And, uh, you know, we've, uh, we've shown you this before. This one, someone took it and reboard it, rechambered it. For the 357 Magnum, so it was probably in a 3220 or something originally, but it appears to have been done, uh, sent back to the factory based on the markings. But it's a really neat old gun, and uh, quite often they would turn the sights around like this. People would for uh, just better on your eyes, or say so get it in and out of a scabbard better. And so somebody had done that with this when I got it. But this is 357 Magnum, again 1916. This gun was made, so there was no 357 Magnum at the time. But that's okay. All right. Oh, I, I, I tried to get away. <laughs> it didn't work. Cool, cool. Flick, he's empty. Model 92. This is the gun you see in Westerns so often. You know, we have a lot of anachronisms in Westerns. Whenever they have a lever gun, quite often it's a Model 92. Not always. But quite often, that's what John Wayne carried, even though the Western was set in the 1880s. But there are a lot of 92s floating around. Really nice little gun. You know, she got the same action as the 86, where the, the two uh, blocks come up and lock up the bolt. So it'll handle, you know, any pistol cartridge with, with ease. So that was an extremely popular rifle. Beautiful. Beautiful gun. Pistol caliber. So now we've got a couple of really nice uh, rifles here, don't we? We've got, we got one that'll handle anything, basically and uh, very, very strongly built, and then one that'll handle any pistol caliber for sure. All right, then we move on up into, oh, 1894, and we come up with a, a rifle here, and this again was designed by John Browning, that would handle a, a you know, fairly uh, powerful round. It's not designed to replace the 86, but this is one that would handle cartridges like this, kind of an intermediate uh, cartridge, I guess, and just be a really handy hunter. The 1894 is basically synonymous with deer rifle. It's, it's taken probably more deer than anything in the, in the country. This is a 30-30 cartridge, and it's famous for the 30-30. It first came out in a different cartridge, but it was very soon after that that they chambered it in 30-30, smokeless rounds. And uh, boy, the rest is history. So this is synonymous with 30-30. And, uh, and deer hunting, the old 94. I think uh, was about seven million of those things made. So it's a very common rifle, uh, very strong. You know, it, it drops down unlike the others. It'll handle a longer cartridge that way uh, for its size. And it has a locking bolt that comes up behind the bolt, a locking block comes up behind the bolt. It's pretty cool. Just a handy rifle, as many of you probably have those. All right, so that's 94. Now. 95. Well, we get into 95. This is the last one. Now, by the way, if I didn't say it, John Browning designed all of these four. Okay? The 86, the 92, the 90, yeah, 94, and the 95. Now, you notice this one's quite different looking. This one is also very strongly built, and it has a magazine, kind of like a bolt gun, so that you put the rounds in here. You have to load it from here. Magazine doesn't really detach. This one's 30 out six. All right, it's a beautiful gun. This one actually was made in 1925, and it it is a powerful rifle. Now, why would you put the magazine down here so that you don't have a tubular magazine with pointed bullets like that, right? So with this one, that's the advantage. You could use the modern 
uh, you know, pointed bullets, 30-06, uh, anything, 303. And it was chambered for some really hot rounds because it was very sturdy. The uh, 405 Winchester, which Teddy Roosevelt loved, and uh, it was chambered for that. He, uh, Teddy Roosevelt has some history with several of these firearms. He, he was a, a hunter, an outdoorsman, and this is one of the guns he liked. He used to call this his, uh, his what, his messing gun or his big medicine or something. And the same with the, uh, the 86, you know, any of the more powerful ones. And uh, if you've seen the, the movie or read the, about the, uh, you know, San Juan Hill and the, the, the Rough Riders, this gun was carried in there along with the Krag and some other firearms. Really, really nice firearm. Very powerful. Again, the big advantage is you could load it with any type of bullet you wanted to, and you didn't have to worry about that uh, tubular magazine, about the rounds being, you know, end to end. Okay? So that, <laughs> that's scary to even do it. So, cool stuff there. That's, uh, so that gives you kind of a, an overview. And uh, if, uh, if you want more information, of course, we have videos, individual videos on, on these, or will. And uh, there's, there's just a wealth of information way more than I could get in my head. It was one of these I was going to fire and I forgot to. I forgot which one it was. I think it was the big boy. I didn't fire that for you, did I? Let me take a couple of shots here. I happen to have some ammo down here. Let me put some up here. Yeah, big old 45, 70 rounds. This thing loads like butter. The action is like butter. And I love it. We've got a couple of targets that I think are well suited for the 4570. Yeah. <laughs> All right. This is a this is one of my favorite firearms. Period. And you know what? We've got a <laughs> cinder block that needs addressing. <laughs> what I tell you? There's one over there too. I might be able to hit. Oh man, a goat! Uh, takes him right down, does it? No hesitation. I bet I can rock that uh, buffalo. After all, it's a buffalo round. First you have to hit it. I must be going under it. Wow. I told you it would rock it. Oh man, love this gun. Winchester, again, you know I like Marlins. You know, uh, some of my favorite, Marlin 94, et cetera, et cetera. But this is Winchester day and uh, whew, beautiful, beautiful guns. Man, I'll tell you, these are, now remember, it depends on what you're comparing them with now, the lever gun. If you're comparing them with this, it's unbelievable how innovative they are, no matter, no matter which one. The, the Henry, even with its uh, drawbacks, its negatives, it's an amazing rifle when you compare it with that. Now, if you're comparing it with a, a later version, you know, then you can start bad-mouthing some of these. You can bad-mouth the cartridge. You can bad-mouth that magazine, some of the things we've talked about, the low-powered cartridges, you know, the toggle link system that was relatively weak, you know, in a lot of ways. Uh, so it just depends on what you're comparing it. And then remember, a lot, one question we get quite often is, why weren't these cool guns used in the military? Because, you know, at the same time these guns are out there, you got guys carrying single shot trap doors, 4570, but they're single shots, you know. Uh, you got all these lever guns around, and the military is carrying a single shot trap door rifle all the way up into the 1890s. And you got this gun, you got this gun, you got that gun, you got that one, you even have, well, I guess, 1886, you know. So, you know, it's like, why? Well, military just, they had some problems with the lever guns. They're afraid you'd shoot too much. They're afraid you would uh, uh, waste ammo, uh, the, f the fragile nature of it, and all those sorts of things. You know how the military is anyway. They're just kind of funny about that sort of thing. Uh, you get political and everything else. So, uh, the bolt gun though, they like the bolt gun later. And the bolt gun, as you know, after 1895, uh, you had the advantage of not having that lever in the way. Somebody shooting from a prone position, then you know it just it just works better. So, lever gun has its place. 
It just uh, it never did really make it in a big way in the military. Oh man, that's a beautiful table. Those are beautiful guns, one of my favorite types. And I, I, I should shut up now because I know you have places you need to get to. You, you need, you, there are places you need to be, I'm sure, rather than watching uh, me. But I just got to shoot something else here. How about this one? Let me just pull out one of my favorites and take a few more shots. You don't mind, do you? I just <laughs> I can't resist. There's something special about a lever gun. I mean to tell you, whether it's a Henry or a 66 or a 73 or a 76 or an 86 or a 92 or a 94 or a 95, <laughs> We're just so uh, happy to have all of them here at the compound at the same time. It, uh, we had a couple, three gaps there. And I got to thinking, I've got all these Winchesters. Got two or three gaps. And I actually went on the prowl and uh, got a couple of gun shops to help us out. Like I say, the Tennessee Gun Country and uh, Guns and Leather. Of course, Taylors and Company. Okay. Oh, man. I know I should let you go. I've gone kind of long, but I just I just can't resist. I've got to shoot something here. Oh, what do I want to shoot? Oh, here's a two liter right here. In a pot. <laughs> oh man, and a cowboy. How appropriate is that? <laughs> oh man, life is so good. <laughs> 